there's a story about a guy who was released from prison. So he had spent at least 10 plus years in the prison system and he was able to get out of the prison system and he was able to find work. He was able to get married, start a family. And so somebody asked him one time, they said, hey man, you know, the statistics show that people who get out of prison are often repeat offenders. They often find themselves back in the prison system. They said, what did you do differently to, to break that, those odds, to, to break that statistic? And he said, well, he said, this is what I did. I can't speak from every prisoner, but what I did was this. He said, when I was in prison, the temptation was to decorate our cells and to make it our home. And he said, all the other prisoners would put up all these these little things on the wall to make it feel like home. So they would spend 10 plus years in that little prison cell and it became their home. And he said, not me. He said, I didn't want to do that. He said, when I left that place, he said, I just want to go on and never go back. You, you might have, you might remember this movie called Shawshank Redemption. It's a 1990s movie. So, there's a word that they use over and over in this movie, and it's called being institutionalized. Do you remember that? So the, the philosophy behind this is that when you are in prison, you become institutionalized to the day in and day outs of the rhythms of the prison system. They tell you what time to get up. They tell you what time to eat. They tell you what time lights out. The next day rolls around, same thing. What time to get up, what time to eat, what time lights go out. So you, can you imagine just living in this system daily for 10 plus, 15 plus years? It becomes the, kind of the norm, right? And then when you get released into the, the freedoms of the world, sometimes it's hard to adjust to the freedoms that you have. You can sleep in if you want. You can stay up late. You can eat whenever you want to. And in the movie Shawshank Redemption, there's this guy, this older gentleman, remember? And he's kind of conflicted that he wants to go back into the system. He ends up taking his life because he can't function in the world. You know, that's a good picture of what the Bible says about our freedom in Christ. Because sometimes in our freedom in Christ, we fall back into the rhythms of the institutionalism of religion. See, there's something that is comfortable about the day in and day out about the religious system that we kind of have those boundaries. But when we have freedom in Christ, it's hard for us to live that way. Paul is going to be talking about this topic today. Living in the freedom of grace. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Galatians. And we're going to be picking up where Ken Black left off last week. And we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 5. Paul writes this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Paul starts off by saying that it is for freedom that Christ Jesus has set you free. Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. He came to set us free from sin. He came to set us free from the things of this world. He came to set us free from religion. That is why Jesus Christ came. And Paul wants them to remember this because he says that they are slowly getting back into their yoke of slavery, this prison system, and he calls it a burden. And that's not where I was trying to go with it. Was that me or was that you, Phil? But you? Okay. So while he's pulling that back up,
Paul's using this illustration of the, that's me. So Paul's using this illustration of the, the yoke of slavery. And he says that what's, what these people are going back to is circumcision. Now that's part of the, the law. And these people are now saying, well, we got to get circumcised to get right with God. And Paul says, look, guys, if you allow yourselves to get circumcised, again, I declare if every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the entire law. The law does not make you right with God. In fact, this is what he says in verse 4. It says, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. It says, you have actually fallen away from grace. He's not talking about losing salvation here. He's talking about when you start adding anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you add any type of work, when you add any type of law, he says, you're actually alienating yourself from Jesus. And you fall from grace. It's either grace in Christ alone alone or you begin to distort grace and begin to add to it and these believers were starting to slowly add to the gospel and of all the things they could have added to the gospel they were adding to it circumcision now i don't know about you but if i'm going to go back to the old testament law and i'm going to look for things to add to grace i'm not going to choose circumcision as one of those things that i'm going to you know be adamant about bringing back in fact paul in the hebrew he's saying Cut it out. No pun intended. Did I get that? Circumcision. Cut it out. All right. So, so these guys, for whatever the reason is, is they, you know, they understand who Jesus is. They're following Jesus, and then they're adding to it circumcision. And Paul says, you have fallen away from grace. It says, for, the, for through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. And then verse 6, it goes on to say, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. It says the only thing that really counts is faith expressing itself in love. You know, for us as a church, um, I think we can easily find ourselves in a rhythm of religious activity. I, in fact, I think that's probably the biggest problem with the church in the world today, and especially in America, is that the church has been, even though we don't say it, we, we make it a religious institution or the creature comforts of the Sunday morning checking off the box. Guys, that's not true faith. When you simply say that I get up to go to church on Sunday and you live like the world Monday, you live like the world Tuesday, you live like the world Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then, oh, by the way, Sunday rolls around, I better go to church. That's not why Christ came to set the captives free. The Christ didn't come to set us free so we can go to church one day a week. And yet that's kind of the norm that we've grown into as a culture. Do you realize that in other countries, we have, we have representatives from other countries in this little body uh, of believers here, but in other countries that people literally live and die daily for their faith? They are at risk of losing their jobs for the name of Jesus. They are at risk for going to prison for the name of Jesus. And I love Francis Chan. Some of you follow this guy, Francis Chan. He he. He was a mega church pastor here in the United States, and he went off and he went to some third world countries and he began to talk to some of these brothers and sisters from other countries. And, and they would, and I think he mentions China one time, and he talks about the underground church in China. And he says, these, these believers are talking to him. And they said, Tell us what church is like in America. And Francis Chan says, Well, you know, in America, we go to church and we have these big buildings and we have these big parking lots and, and he says, and if there's no parking, people leave. And the people said, no, you're joking, right? And, they, and he said, no, for real. He said, sometimes we don't have enough parking, so they just go to another church. Or they just go home. Or they just go to lunch. And the people said, well, we walk for days just to go and hear the word of God proclaimed. 
And Francis Chan says, no, well, you don't understand the United States. It's kind of a complex world we live in. That If we don't have like a good children's ministry for our kids, people leave. And the people laughed. He said, are you serious? Yeah. And sometimes, you know, if, if, you know, the music's too loud, people leave. And that's just the way, what we've made church. But guys, when we look at the word of God, and if you are really serious about your faith and you open up, take time to open up this word and you begin to just look at the early church, you will quickly discover that it's not about Sunday and then I'll see you next Sunday. And then it's Sunday and it's I'll see you next Sunday. It is about every day. Jesus made some strong statements to people. He says, if you want to follow me, you got to deny yourself every Sunday. No, daily. Carry your cross daily and follow me. This is what faith is, is really at the heart of what Christ wants for us. When he set us free from slavery, he didn't set us free just to go to church once a week. He set us free so that we could follow him. Now, I'm not opposed to church. And in fact, that's why that gathering portion is today. I'm all for that. And if I could... I would say, what are the ways we can gather more people so that people can hear from the Word of God? There's nothing wrong with that. But if we simply make it a Sunday to Sunday to Sunday activity, then we have fallen back into a yoke of slavery. Might not be circumcision, but it could be the, the yoke of a religiosity of the American culture. And Paul goes on to say, he says, guys, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not circumcised. So it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or if you're a Gentile. In fact, the gospel really is for all people. It is for all people. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, that's what the gospel is here for. And yet I think sometimes even me as your pastor, we, I get caught up in our, a 10-mile radius. And I call that my community. And, and I look at, I'm reminded over 10 years that we've been as a church, 10 years in this community, and the community has grown tremendously. But I'm reminded, guys, that the reason why we started this church and we gave it the name Vista was because that if you open your eyes and you look at the view, the Vista, you'll see the harvest. And I'm, I'm not talking about like farming harvest. I'm talking about souls. When we started this church 10 years ago, I looked out my window and I was like, oh, I love my beautiful view because it was before all the houses were built. And then all of a sudden they started building these houses on top of each other, literally. And I was like, there goes my view. And then God said, no, that is your view. Those people are why you are here because they need a place to worship me. And that is your view because some of those people don't know who I am and you have the gospel that you can share that with them so 10 years in guys and 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 I'm, I'm very thankful for vista community church but if you've driven down calabra some of you might live off of calabra if you've driven off calabra down calabra going towards a lake you will be surprised there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of homes and there's not a lot of churches on calabra Drive down Petranco Road, you're getting frustrated with all the traffic and all the people. I know you are because I see your posts. <laughs> but what if you looked at all that traffic as people who need Jesus or people who need a place to worship? See, I think that, guys, that, that we have fallen into, what, it's, what's, what about us? Let's just be comfortable with a Sunday, and we'll come in, and we'll, we'll sing some songs, and we'll give an offering, and we'll drink some coffee, and we'll shake each other's hands, and we'll say, how are you doing? And then... We'll see you next week. And maybe some of us will, will take the next step and we'll get into a Bible study, which is really important because we want you to have life on life with other believers. But I think if we're not careful, we forget the reason why God has left us on this planet is to love him, to love one another, and to make his great name known. Man, I, I, I surround myself with pastors who challenge me all the time. There's a... a fellow pastor of ours who planted Mission Community Church down the road. And so, man, he and I, man, we pray for our community because he's on the other side of the sea world. I'm on this side of the sea world. And we start praying and just dreaming. What would it be like to help partner together to plant another church together? I mean, surely this little church hasn't reached all the thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this area. Obviously, we need more churches. 
I got a friend of mine who's, who's a Spanish-speaking pastor, um, and he, he started a second language service at Northwest Bible Church. And he lives on Petrenko Road. And so I've been praying with him. I was like, what, is, what would it look like if down the road we partnered and, and started a second language service for Vista? Because the people around here need the gospel. And then I, st- I started talking to a friend of mine named Chad from Laredo, and he pastors a church about 700. And his dream, his vision is to plant a church in every zip code in Laredo, Texas. There's five zip codes in Laredo, Texas. And here's the ironic thing about Laredo, Texas. It's this primarily Spanish-speaking culture, and the church of 700 is in all English. And he realizes that they need churches in Spanish to reach the people for Jesus all along Laredo. But I have friends who pastor down in Brownsville. I got a friend who pastors in College Station. I got friends who pastor in Waco. All along the border, Del Rio, Eagle Pass. See, so many times we get so caught up in just the the little picture of our community, which it starts there. But we got to constantly be reminded that the reason why Jesus Christ set us free is that so we can worship him and help others be free also. So I'm thankful for 10 years, but I'm also thankful that God is not done with this little church yet. So let me just ask, let me just pose this one question. What would it look like for for us in the next two to five years to be really serious about disciple making? We keep talking about that. Pam and I, Angelo and I, the, the Angelo and I, the elders, we've wrestled with this. We're trying to figure it all out. We still trying to. It's this little slippery, and it should be slippery because that's what Jesus doesn't give you clear. It's very organic, but it's it's about pointing people to Jesus. But what if we got really serious in the next two to five years? And what if every ministry in this church was serious about multiplying? another disciple, helping them grow. Not just me, but helping the next generation grow. And then equipping others. I I love Angelo. Angelo was not here today. Angelo, I love, seriously, I I love this guy. You know why? Because he challenges me. You know why he challenges me? Because he's a multiplier. He's like a little fruit fly. (laughs) You know, my wife, we have these fruit flies in our kitchen. We can't get rid of them because they just keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And Angelo is a little multiplier. No pun intended. They just had their baby. I mean, he multiplies everywhere, I mean, just everything he does. But when Angelo came, we hired him to be on the worship team. And then, I mean, we got like two or three drummers. We got two or three guitarists, two or three vocalists. And, you know, that's his heart is to multiply. And what if, what if he kept multiplying? What if? Our children's ministry multiply leaders and our setup team multiply leaders and our every ministry in this this church, it wasn't a solo act. It was like we're gonna help the next person replace me and do my job. Even me as a pastor, you know, I could say no, I gotta preach every Sunday, but no, I share the pulpit with guys. Because it's not about me and it's not about any one of you, it's about Jesus. But here's where I'm going with this. What if we got so serious about multiplying? that we actually multiplied every level in this church and we sent out people to help start a new church. Some of you that doesn't even resonate with, and that's fine. But do you realize that this church was started with 13 people 10 years ago? Somebody sent 13 people out to help start this work, and I'm sure you're grateful for that, those 13 people. Those people, most of them are long gone. But it's okay. Because it's not about them, it's not about me, it's about us. So Paul is telling us about our freedom. And then he's going to warn us. He says, warning, guys, the enemy does not want you to live in your freedom. Let's look at these verses here. Verse 7. It says, you were running a good race, church. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? It says, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And then he has this quote here. It says, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I love how he uses the imagery of a runner. Any of you guys run in here? I used to run. Some of you are new to this church. You have no idea that I used to run. I used to run. I was about 15 pounds lighter back then. I know because I was trying to put on some clothes yesterday. I was like, these don't fit anymore. Here's the thing with running. 
I used to run two miles. I used to just go out and run, just two miles. And then I was like, you know what, I'm going to do three. And I did three. And then I was like, you know, I used to live in by the West Creek area, and so I, from my house to the end where 16 to 4 is and back to uh, Grossenbacher was two and a half miles one way, two and a half miles the other way. I was like, you know what, I'm going to run to that thing, and I'm going to turn around and come back. Five miles. I got to the point where I could like, I'm just going to go for a, a run, and I would do five miles every day, every day, every day. And then I found out that when you train for a half marathon, that you do five miles, and then you add a little bit more one day a week. And I was like, I can do that. And then I ran a half marathon. So did Roger. And so did Rebecca. And so did Elizabeth. And so did a bunch of other people. We were running together. And then we're like, you know what? Let's get crazy, and let's run a whole marathon. And I actually ran two marathons in my life. I almost died. <laughs> but then you start making little excuses here and there. Well, you know, I got little ankle hurts. Oh, it's kind of bad weather. Oh, this will be a season where I'll lift, you know. And then you wake up three years later, and you go try to do a one-mile run, and you almost die. <laughs> Paul's saying, guys, you were running a good race, church. You were headed in the right direction. You were doing all the right things. You were loving Jesus. You were loving one another. You were making his name known. And he says, you were just saying it's grace alone and Christ alone. And all of a sudden now somebody's cutting in on your race and knocking you off your track. And he said, and it happened very subtly. And it's the enemy. And he uses that little, that little phrase as a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. You just drop a little yeast in and dough, and it'll just slowly take it over. But it's, it's a slow process, but it will eventually take it over. He says, this is what the enemy does to you. And he says, I am confident that in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who has thrown you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Did you know, guys, that the Bible always refers to the devil as one who wants to destroy. He refers to him as a wolf. He refers to him as a lion. He refers to him as a snake. And I think sometimes we think the devil just wants to just discourage us, distract us. But really, the devil wants to take you off course, and he wants to literally just dis destroy your faith. And that, that's what he wants. And so when I was looking at this, I, I was reminded of a, of a snake. In Texas, you know, we go out to property, we go out to the land, like the church land, and we tell the kids to watch out for snakes. What snake are we looking for when we go out to the property? See, every one of you in instantly say rattlesnakes, right? Because that's what Texas is known for. And they bite you, they're going to kill you. They're going to, you know, inject all that venom in you. But the thing about a rattlesnake is that they... They give you warning, right? You walk up on it, and you're like, okay, and you walk away. That's not how the enemy in the Bible was described. He doesn't like, I'm over here, you know, I'm giving you warning. No, he's more like a python. You know those boa constrictors, those pythons? You ever see those on, you know, those TV? I was watching this. Crocodile versus boa constrictor. Who's going to win? Crocodile's got those big old teeth. Boa constrictor's got those little bitty teeth. So this boa constrictor came up, and the crocodile was laying in the water, and he opens his mouth. Wah! He's like, I see you. And he's like, you see me? And all of a sudden, his tail goes like this. And he starts wrapping the crocodile up. And he's, the crocodile's like so focused on the head of this snake, and all of a sudden, this thing starts to constrict this crocodile. And before you know that crocodile just dead. And you know what this constrictor does then? That bow, that whatever that big snake is called? It eats them. And the thing is like little, but it somehow his mouth opens up and he starts eating this thing. The enemy, guys, is like that. He will take little things in your life and he will, they could be good things, and he will slowly get you off course from your faith. And I think the number one thing the enemy does in the Western culture is our busy schedules. I mean, we live in a, in a world that, that to be productive is, is very valued. You work 40 hours a week, someone else is working 50 hours a week. You might as well work 50 hours a week. You better put some overtime in. 
You want to be a good parent? You better take your kids to everything, you know, they can sign up for. They got homework. They got drill practice. They got band practice. They got football practice. They got cheer practice. They got baseball practice. They got all sorts of things. You want to be a a good citizen in the community? Then you better serve on certain boards, and you better run for this board and run for that board, and you're all this and that. And, guys, here's the thing. I do all those things. I'm guilty of all that busyness. And there's nothing wrong with being a good citizen, nothing wrong with being a great parent, nothing wrong with with being a hard worker. But if you put Jesus Christ at the back of all that, then you've got it all upside down. And that's the slow work of the enemy that slowly gets you distracted to do a lot of little good things and you forget about what's really important. That's him. That's why every day, guys, every day you, I can't do this for you, every day you have to make time for him. Jesus says, to seek first the kingdom. You got to seek first him daily. Then all those other things will take place. You know, another thing the enemy will use would be um, little things like um, friends. You know, how many of you guys are graduating? High schoolers? One, two? You're graduating? No, three? You're not graduating. So here's the thing. Here's, here's what statistics tell us about college. Okay, so pay attention because I'm only going to tell you once. Jonah, Jonah you know because you've been in college for a year. So here, here's what I'm going to tell you. This is true. True statistics. The people that you hang around with the first week of college is going to be the people, probably the people you're going to hang out with for the next two to three plus years. Because when you go to school, the first week everyone wants you. The fraternities want you, and they're, they're, you know, they're coming and trying to get, get you to rush this fraternity. The sororities want you. If you're in ath- athletics, you're going to spend time with them. If you're in the band, you're going to spend time with them. If, if whatever the case might be, that first week is the people that are going to connect with you, and they're going to be that safe haven you're going to feel comfortable with, and then that's going to take you. Now, if you connect with the wrong group, then you're going to hang out with the wrong group for three to five years five years hopefully not that one that was my story that's why campus crusade does their very best to to meet you when you show up at the school because they realize that that you need jesus and you just don't know it yet so those of you who are going off to college look for the opportunities to fellowship with the right people because the wrong people will take you off course real quick Let's conclude here. Let's, let's look at this. So Paul's going to remind us that our freedom was never given to us as a license to sin. Verse 11, it says this. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? So in other words, people were falsely accusing Paul of, hey, you used to preach that. You know, Paul's like, I'm not preaching that anymore. I'm preaching Jesus. In that case, defense of the cross has been abolished. Now, Paul's going to say some pretty hard words here. He says in verse 12, As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way when they're circumcising themselves and just go ahead and do the whole thing, emasculate themselves. That's how offensive Paul is when it comes to these people who are distorting the gospel. He's like, I don't want these people to reproduce. If they're going to be preaching circumcision, let them preach circumcision. Let them be first in line. Let them go ahead and just go ahead and keep on cutting away. Verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called not to be in religious activity, not to be slaves to the sins of this world, not to any of that stuff. You were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. When it all comes down to it, guys, we are only to do a few basic things. Worship God, love God, love others as ourselves, right? Those are the two greatest commandments. Love God first, love others, the body. But the great commission is to go and be lights to the world as well. We have to be proclaimers of the good news. Jesus is going to save who he's going to save. We don't save people, but he's entrusted us with the message.
this is what the early church understood. This is what we need to understand. For the last 2,000 years, the church has been practicing what we call an ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And so today we're going to practice that with one another. And so it's a reminder of what Christ did for us. It's a reminder to love him because he first loved us. It's a reminder to love one another. And it's also a reminder to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the world.